Should we start? Okay. So yeah, before we start, Onan is going to say some things. Yeah, this is the uh, for those who are in attendance either in person or, or remotely. This is this is the last uh, session of the of the so-called pure model theory course of the pure model theory so-called course whatever <laughs> the, the pure model theory course here in fields and uh, and uh, just thanks to the people who were attending the course and you know any comments that came out and also thanks to uh which i was coordinating and thanks also to itai kaplan and gabe for contributing lectures to the whole thing and, okay and thanks to you too okay that's it okay okay uh thanks for coming early some people online that's nice um I'll, I'll start with a little bit of a recap I wrote I wrote one of the theorems from last time on the board and we'll just reference it as we need to. But let me just let me just recap last time. So I'm, I'm not going to restate things, but I, I, I wrote down this theorem A, which was essentially the Maliara Shala stable regularity lemma with some small adjustments that we discussed. And then I and then I wrote down theorem B, which I've copied again over there. And this you can essentially think of as like as like the an analog for Kiesler measures and arbitrary structures, Kiesler measures on arbitrary structures, whatever, which is more or less modeled off of Maliaris Pillay. Okay, and then and then we did we discussed so we discussed these things and then we proved we did the argument for B implies A using a standard kind of pseudo finite construction. And so the goal for today is to prove theorem B. Um, but before I do that, I, before I do that, I want to just say one thing, kind of as a as in response to some feedback. I I I've called this kind of like a model theoretic proof of Maliaris Chalet, but maybe perhaps that's a bit misleading because. That, that maybe suggests that their work doesn't have model theory in it, which is not the case. I mean, they, they give a completely finitary argument, so things have to be very careful or whatever, but, but model theory is still there. They use Shala 2 rank, they use finite indiscernible sequences and things like that. So perhaps it would be better to call this like a pseudo finite proof of theorem A rather than a model theoretic proof. Okay. All right, good. So we're going to prove, so I think this is now section three after one and two last time and so it's the proof of b but i'm not going to jump right into it i want to start by reminding kind of some things about about Kieser measures and stuff so all right uh we're going to fix an l structure m arbitrary structure in an arbitrary language and a particular formula of B. With variables partitioned into two tuples X and Y. Okay. Um, so the statement of theorem B, which you know I'll kind of be referencing as we go along, is about this kind of structure theorem for uh, any any time you have Kiesler measures with respect to this formula, whenever the formula is stable. But I just want to start by recalling some facts about Kiesler measures because the, this proof it has a lot of topological ingredients on the type space. Okay, so last time we defined a, a Kiesler phi measure was a finitely additive probability measure on the phi definable subsets of of um, of M, and so I just want to rem remind you or, or state this fact that so for any uh, Kiesler phi measure, a mu on this Boolean algebra of definable subsets, phi definable subsets of m to the x. So remember, this is where I, I, I plug in parameters for y, those define particular subsets of m to the x, and I take the Boolean algebra generated by that, and then mu is just a finitely additive probability measure on that Boolean algebra. 
And so the fact is that for any measure like this, you get a, you, you get a uniquely determined measure on the corresponding type space. So there exists a unique, and I'll remind some of the words in a second, but let me write it down, regular Borel probability measure, uh, which for now I'm gonna call mu hat just to distinguish them, but then we'll identify them in a second on the corresponding type space S phi M. And what's the connection between the two things? So such that for any, if I take any phi definable subset X of, of M, what's the connection between the two, the two measures? So, so the keys that measure mu assigns some measure to this definable set X and it's equal to the corresponding Borel measure mu hat applied to the set of types that concentrate or contain the formula, a formula defining this set. So I'll remind some of the notation. So where this brackets X is just a set of types. And I'm, I'm kind of abusing notation a little bit by identifying a fee formula with the fee definable set it defines, but there shouldn't be any issues um, going along. Okay, and then this is a clopen set. So on and went through all of this kind of topological setting on the type space before. These are the basic clopen sets um, in the type space. And this is, a, this is like a, a general thing, right? I mean, this, th this same situation happens whenever you just have a Boolean algebra and then you look at the space of ultra filters on that Boolean algebra, the stone space of the Boolean algebra. Okay. Now, uh, all right, so it's a probability measure, but now it's on like a, it's on the Borel subsets of this topological space. So that means we're talking about countably additive now, not finitely additive. Borel just means you, you, you assign measures to any Borel set. And so I'll remind you what regular means in this context. So regular can mean a lot of different things depending on what kind of space you have. But if you're looking at this kind of nice compact space, then in our situation, regular means that for any Borel set, B contained in the type space, I can approximate the measure of B by opens and closed kind of around it. So the measure mu hat of B is the supremum of the measure of any closed set contained in it. So C subset of B, C closed. And it's also the infimum of the measure of any open set U that contains the Borel set. So B contained in U, U open. Okay, so this regularity is what's responsible for the uniqueness here, because, okay, the measures are really controlled by the opens and close, and those are essentially controlled by the clopens. All right. And then we won't use this, but I'll just say, moreover, this really is a correspondence. So this map that sends mu to mu hat is, is a bijection. We won't really need this, but it's good to know. And so in practice, one really just kind of thinks of these two things as being the same thing. So we identify, I'll just say mu equals mu hat. And it should be clear from context when I'm talking about mu as a measure on formulas versus mu as a measure on Borel sets. But if it's not, feel free to you know, ask me to clarify or correct a mistake or something. Okay. So, uh, Gabe, just for the projection, you mean for uh, regular measures, right? For uh, you got no. What did you say? So, when you Sorry. say projection, it's between um, finite additive measures on definable sets and and regular measures, for well regular yeah. measures, right? Yeah. And then they right. and then the fact that it's a projection just follows from uniqueness, no? Well, the fact that it's injective, I guess, follows from unique. Yeah, I mean, the fact that it's surjective isn't really that hard either, because if you have a regular Borel probability measure on it, and you just look at what it does to the clopens, it'll be pretty clear that yeah. that's a Kieser measure. Because it, it, yes. If you take to be closed, the measure of the closed set is going to be the, the inf of the measures of the formulas contained in the closed set. So right, right. Okay, so Anand just said, if you take B to be a closed set, then by compactness, it'll be like the infimum of the measures of the clopen sets containing it, aka the formula or above it. So aka the formulas. All right, so there's various things. We, we won't really need to worry about this too much, actually. It's a good exercise. It's hard, it's hard to find like a nice clear account of it, say in general, but I think Fremlin's book has it. 
but in the setting of measures, this multi-theoretic setting, it's in Pierre's book um, on NIP, some section somewhere, and he just says how to construct it. It's not, it's not anything terribly magical. Okay, so let me do an example. We, I mentioned this example out loud, but I didn't write it down. But I mean, it's an important example for us. So any any type. I mean, it's it's even more clear now that we have this fact stated. But if I take a type P. Uh, in the type space, I, I said this last time before we had this fact, I said, well, you can think about this as a Kiesler measure on phi formulas, right? Where you say the measure of a formula is zero if it's in the type and the measure of a formula is one, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Measure of a formula is zero if it's not in the type and a measure of a formula is one if it's in the type. But now it's really clear what's happening here. We're just talking about the corresponding Dirac measure at that point in the type space. So I'm gonna write that down. So any any type is a, zero comma one valued uh, Kiesler fee measure. And we have that if I take this, I think about it as a Kiesler measure, and then I think, well, what, what Borel measure is that giving me what is P hat? Well, it's just this Dirac measure at P, which is sometimes denoted this way, delta P. I won't use this, but I'm, I'm writing it down now to, to kind of maybe if it's triggering. So a Dirac measure at P, so the Borel measure that gives a set measure one, if it has P in it and measure zero otherwise, but still we're going to identify um, P and P hat and Delta P in general. So, but this, this might, you have to just remember this because when I, as I write things down, if I'm thinking about P as being a measure versus being P as being a point in the type space that's getting measured by something else, all right. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now we wanna start working towards the proof of theorem B. And that's really gonna be kind of the whole time today. And then if I have some time at the end, I might say some other general remarks about other directions, but this is really the, the main thing for today. Okay, so let's start working towards the, the proof of theorem B. So we assume our formula phi x, y is stable now. And Okay, maybe now's a good time to just kind of briefly remind you what the theorem says. It says if I take a, a phi Kiesler measure, or oops, Kiesler phi measure, right? I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Okay, so let mu be a, a, a Kiesler measure on phi, and then nu be a Kiesler measure on phi star. So you're plugging in parameters for x and measuring subsets in the y variable. Then, okay, I get this kind of regularity statement, which says for any epsilon greater than zero, there are these bounds m and n such that then for any other possibly different gamma greater than zero, I can partition X space into these M sets. I can partition Y space into these N sets, W zero up to WN with the following properties, which are meant to mirror what theorem A said before. So, okay, first the sets in the partition are definable in the right way. So I can measure them by mu and nu. Second is that the V0 and the W0 act like these exceptional sets of points. So the mu measure of V0 is less than epsilon. The new measure of W0 is less than epsilon. And then finally, the, the one that's sort of the messiest is this kind of deconstructed homogeneity statement that's meant to tell you that like the density of relations of phi between VI and WJ is close to zero or close to one. But in the absence of talking about product measures and that sort of thing, we just write it down in this in this particular way for every ij other than the v0 and the w0 there exists these unique truth value zero or one and some maybe i'll draw the picture again just to remind you so i'll just draw yeah draw the picture so vi wj and then let's just say we're in the situation where tij equals one uh then okay after throwing away a little bit of the wj side so i get this slightly smaller set W prime, but it has new measure at least one minus gamma times the measure of the whole thing. And then inside this set, if I pick any point and I look over here at what's its phi neighborhood, the things that are that are connected to it, this, is, this has measure almost the whole thing, the new measure of the, the subset of VI that this instance of phi cuts out is at least one minus gamma times the measure of VI. 
And then if t were equal to zero, it would be the same thing, except you would say negation of t. So either yes or no, but it's uniform for the whole pair. OK, so that's just a recap of the theorem. All right, so assume phi is stable, then we fix our measures. So fix mu and nu, as in the statement of theorem B. And so the first thing that we want to do is just prove a general result about uh, Kiesler measures on stable formulas before we get into any of this stuff. So we're going to kind of work on mu for a bit and then apply the same results to nu just by using the fact that phi star is also stable. Okay, so we're going to focus on uh, mu for a second, and then I'm going to let S be the support of this of this measure as a Borel measure. So the set of types which get positive measure by mu. Okay. Now this is a this is a this is a perfectly fine set to define. Um, it could be empty in general, right? Some measures won't have these kinds of positive measure atoms in the type space. But uh, what we can say in general is that it's countable, right? By additivity of the measure, if I fix some positive number, there can only be finitely many points that have measure that bigger than that. So if you union overall, say, rationals or whatever, you get only countably many things. And so in particular, it's Borel. It's a Borel set, so I can talk about the measure of the of the set. Um, okay, and so then the theorem, the main sort of theorem, which I'll call theorem C, is that under this assumption that phi is stable, this set S is actually not empty. Um, it's actually like almost everything according to the measure. So the measure of this set S is one. Maybe I should have called it like the point support or something. Hey, well, how did you get the fact that it's countable again? So yeah, fi fix fix a positive number, epsilon. There can only be finitely many points that have measure bigger than epsilon, because otherwise, by if you had infinitely many, by additivity, you would be able to get bigger than measure one with the probability point. measure. Point. Yeah, these are disjoint points. So if each one, if you had like 10 of them of measure a third, that would add. Oh, that sorry, I didn't notice. Oh, I did notice this is a measure of all p of p as, as yeah. A, so, this is, so this is what I said earlier. Is, yeah, I mean, right now we're literally measuring. All right. So it's okay, a singleton so p. It's supposed to be a singleton. Maybe I, yeah. yeah, I should say this. You're right. You're right. This is a measure of the singleton set p. You're right. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So then, for any positive, say rational, there's only finitely many singleton points that have measure bigger than that rational, and so then union over all the positive rationals and you get countably many singleton points of positive measure. So yeah, we're really talking about singletons of positive measure. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so then the main, th the main theorem that uses stability now is that the measure of this set S is one. And so I'm just gonna write this so I can write, I can, I can then write my measure, I can represent my measure mu as this possibly infinite but still countable sum over all p in s. I'm going to rewrite it later so it looks a little bit better, but I'll just write this and say what I mean. So here I'm writing it as an infinite weighted sum of types, Dirac measures, where the coefficient is the actual measure that the that the type gets. Okay, so if you just if you just take the fact that the measure of the support is one, the measure of any Borel set is equal to the measure of that set intersect s, and then that will exactly be this going along the points in S and seeing how much uh, you get. OK. All right. Is the theorem clear? OK. So the proof of the theorem is short modulo a lemma, which is also not too hard to prove because Anand already kind of did all the, the tools before. So I'll write down this lemma, we'll prove the theorem, then we'll prove the lemma. So the lemma says that if I uh, have a subset X of the type space, which is closed for now, so is closed and has positive measure, then there's some point, there's some type in that set that's responsible for this thing having positive measure. Then there exists some point, some type P in X, such that the measure of, yeah, the singleton, I'm going to keep not writing the singletons if that's okay. Okay. 
So every closed set of positive measure contains a, an actual point that has positive measure. And so then the, the proof of, if given this theorem, or sorry, this lemma, the proof of theorem C is, is essentially immediate because if you know that this, this lemma holds for all closed sets, then by regularity of the measure, it will hold for any Borel set as well. Because if you have a Borel set of positive measure, then there's some closed set inside of it that has positive measure. Take a point in there, it'll be okay. So by regularity, um, the lemma holds for any Borel X, in particular, this set at, or the negation, I guess, of this set S, whatever, it doesn't matter. So that tells you that the, the measure of the complement of S has to be zero. Otherwise, it would contain a point with positive measure and that would contradict the definition of S. Okay, so it really is just about the lemma. So let's prove the lemma. Right, so maybe I guess I should have said that like this, you've probably heard, or you may have heard this theorem before stated in, in the form of saying that if you have a Kiesler measure on a stable formula, it's a sum of types. So every Kiesler measure on a stable formula is a sum of types. That's what this is. Okay, so we'll prove the lemma. Right, and so basically this is just going to come down to this Cantor Bendixson analysis that Anand did in his lectures. So I'm going to take that for granted. I'm not going to reprove that, but I'll give some references to, to the numbering. I think it's the right numbering from, from his course. Okay, so fix a closed set. Yeah, so, so it might be better to think like this is a coefficient. This is a real number. And then it might be better to put delta p here, just visually, if you like. Yeah, but I won't later on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So fix a closed set X uh, with positive measure. Okay. So now, Setting aside the positive measure bit, this is a closed set in inside this uh, stone space over the stable formula phi. And so on improve last night, or last, not last time, uh, I almost said last night. Yeah, on improved. Yeah. He proved when? I don't know, fifth, fifth or sixth lecture, I think. I don't quite remember that uh, the Kander Bendixson rank of the stone space is, is defined. Um, okay, so, so then. The Kander Bendixson rank of this set X is less than infinity, meaning the maximal Kander Bendixson rank of any point in X is how he defined this. Um, and this is so I'm just going to remind you. So for this for this rank, C definition, I believe it was 313 from Pillay's course. And uh, sorry, this is going to be a confusing sentence. So see this definition for the definition of Kenner Bennickson rank. And the statement I'm making here is by lemma 315. This is the key use of stability in the whole proof. So it's, it's hidden in what Anand already presented is, right? So if, if you had undefined Kenner Bennickson rank, then you would be able to build this tree and contradict definability of types. You'd have too many types. Well, I mean, it's true for any, I mean, if you take a closed subset of SV, you can think about that as a space of its own right, look at it, look at this. The can so, but this was just defined as the supremum of all the CB ranks of the points in X. Okay, so there's, yeah, it's equivalent to stability, but I don't, but maybe over, 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 a, saturated model. over a saturated model, okay. Maybe it's equivalent to stability in a model over not a saturated model, but okay. Yeah, okay, so yeah, I'm not gonna redo that proof, but that the idea was that you you go in and if you, if you, if you 
had points, if you were able to build arbitrarily high Cantor Bennigsen ring of points, you'd make a tree of types that are distinct. You get uncountable, you, you know, go to a, you'll have to go to a smaller model containing parameters like a countable model or whatever. Uh, and you'll get uncountably many phi types over a countable set, and it would contradict the finability of types. Yes, by the way, I mean, this, this TB rank on the types is like the local form by formula version of morning rank. Yeah, so Anand and says. Morning rank by formula. Yeah. yeah, so Anand says that the local, the, just for people online, the CB rank is like the local formula by formula Morley rank. It's also like the R infinity rank, shall R infinity rank. Okay. All right, oh, all just right. so another, another comment is that it's yeah. actually finite in this case, not only bounded. That's true. It's actually finite. Okay. We won't need any of these particulars. So, but we're going to, so we're going to prove this thing. Then we, we, we proceed by induction on rank on the CB rank of the set of the closed set X. Okay. So if the rank is zero, then X is actually finite. I think this was either stated as like an exercise or whatever, but it's easy to check for if you go back to the definition. And so then we're done. If I have a finite set of positive measure, one of the singletons in it has to have positive measure. Okay, so now let's assume for ranks strictly less than the Kander Bendixson, whatever the rank is of our fixed set. And so then I'm going to go and I'm look at I look at the points of maximum rank. So let F be the set of types in X such that the CB rank of P is actually the CB rank is the maximum rank of types in X. So I'll just I'll I'll remind you. So what was true to this? So then F is this is non-empty and it's finite, although we won't directly use this, I don't think, um, by, this was fact 3.14. Okay, so the, the, the CB rank of X is defined as the soup of the CB rank of points in X. And so the fact says that that's actually attained by some finite set of, of types actually have maximum rank inside X. Okay, um, and so now without loss of generality, so this is a finite set. Without loss of generality, I can assume that it has positive measure, or sorry, it has measure zero, right? It's a subset of X, so if it had positive, if it was, and it's, uh, oh, you're right, no, we do use finite. Yeah. I guess we, yeah, we just need to know it's closed, but we actually have finite, so we'll leave that. All right, so it's not empty and finite in particular, whatever, closed. If it had positive measure, then it would contain a point of positive measure because it's finite again, we'll just leave it at that. So without loss of generality, I can assume that the measure of F is zero. Is that clear? Sorry, I tripped over that. So I need to clarify. Okay. Um, all right, so that means that if I look at the measure of X minus this finite set of points, this is again a Borel set. So, and it has positive measure because I've taken X, which has positive measure and removed a set of measure zero. Now this is just a Borel set, but by regularity of the measure, I can find a closed set in there that has positive measure. So by regularity, there exists some closed set Y contained in X minus F such that the measure of Y is positive. Um, and now, again, an, an easy thing to check. Anna may not have stated this explicitly, but it's, these are all very easy to check from the definitions of the rank. If I take X and I remove all the points of maximum rank, and then I take a closed set inside there, the rank will go down. So just check, um, or note, I should really say, it's not much to check, that the CB rank of Y is strictly less than the CB rank of X. I've removed all the points of maximum rank. So I can apply induction to Y. Y has positive measure. Uh, it's a closed set, whatever. So by induction, there exists a point in Y, which is in X. And that's the end of the proof.
All right. Okay. Yeah. No, um, there will be one other use of stability to prove theorem B, although, well, maybe I'll say something about it later. Yeah, we will use we will use definability of types in the proof of theorem B also, but I'll, I'll make a remark about that later. Or maybe I'll make a remark about it now so I don't forget. So we're going to use definability of types to prove theorem B, which is a statement about arbitrary stable formulas, arbitrary measures, arbitrary structures. However, if your only goal was to do the pseudo finite argument and prove the finitary result about the maliara shola theorem, then it would be enough to know that these measures are sums of types, get a slightly different statement that a priori looks weaker, transfer it downstairs, and then apply something that Caroline likes to call the two sticks lemma downstairs, which is like a clever counting thing that, okay, well, you talk to her about it at some point, she's got a, a whole philosophy, but anyway, you could use that to then prove a regularity. So in fact, if you want, if you're, if, if you're really just thinking about what kind of pseudo finite argument will give you Maliara Shala stable regularity. It's really just about knowing that these pseudo finite counting measures are sums of types. That's it. Okay. But we're, but we're kind of after like, I don't know, this is, this is in some sense a more general statement because it's, it's talking about regularity upstairs in the model in an arbitrary model, arbitrary keys or measure. Okay. So like, is it, better to have, is it better to have a break really early or have a break a little bit later? Because right now we're, maybe I should keep going and have a break a little later. What could be it, it really doesn't matter. It's up to, the, maybe we should just press on. Everybody's got a lot of energy. It's morning. Okay. All right, so then we'll go back um now to the proof of the uh, we're now about to start the proof of theorem b although to make sure i get my notation right so now i'm going i'll apply theorem c to both mu and nu which i can do because phi and phi star are both stable so uh right and i'll change the notation a little bit now to make it a little more convenient and hopefully a little more clear so i'm going to write mu as this sum over some countable index set i of some number alpha i times some type pi, or you know, if in your mind, Dirac measure at pi if that's better. Um, and I will also decompose nu this way as some sum over some other index set j, some beta j times qj, where okay, i and s, sorry, i and j, these are countable index sets, they could be finite, so we'll think of them as initial segments of the positive integers. So it'll help with our numbering in a second. And um, okay, so PI is a phi type over the model. Alpha I is the mu measure of the singleton PI, just going by this. Similarly, QJ is a phi star type over the model. And the coefficient beta J is the new measure of QJ. I won't write this, but I'm, I'm going to, no, they, okay. And they're all, po these are all positive numbers. But I'm, I'm taking it from this. So these are actually positive. I'm not writing in zero times anything. So that's okay. All right. Yeah, as long as the measure of the, maybe this is a good thing to say. So note, um, so maybe, okay, you have to tweak this a little bit. Maybe if you're talking about a sum of weighted distinct types, then it's it's a Kiesler measure as long as the, the weight's sum to one. So note, but this is a good thing to say, the note sum over I and I, alpha I equals one equals sum over J and J beta J. But you could, you know, you could always normalize or whatever if it was something else. Sorry, it's not zero. Okay. So now we'll start the proof of theorem B. Why do you know the initial segment of Well, it could be finite. So it could be like one. Z plus. 
I mean, it's common to all Yeah, but I, okay, well, maybe it'll be clear when I actually write. I'm going to ask me that question again in like 30 seconds. Oh my gosh, I got to hurry. All right, so we're going to prove theorem B. So we have our measures mu and nu. We've written them as sums of types. So what are you doing next? You need to fix an epsilon and find the m and n. So fix some epsilon greater than zero. And now to answer your question, you have to choose some integers m and n greater than or equal to one, such that if I take the sum of i equaling one to m, alpha i and the sum of j equaling one to n beta j, these are at least one minus epsilon. So that was why I did countable initial segments, just so that this notation makes sense. One to n. Otherwise, what are you talking about? What if what if I index i by the primes? Then i equaling one to n won't make sense. So okay, <laughs> it's not nothing deep. Okay, all right. But these these are possibly finite sums, so maybe I don't. I actually can hit one, but I think in in general you would expect actually infinite sums. But the, but the but the whole sum is one, so I with a finite sum I can get as close to one as I want, and this gives me the m and n only depending on epsilon. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. All right, good. So now we have our M and N. And so I need to fix a gamma, but I can do it after. After getting the M and N, I can then choose a different gamma. And for people who maybe missed last week or whatever, what this, what this is representing is the fact that you can get the regularity involving that function that sigma function applied to the size of the partition rather than just some global epsilon that you take from the beginning. So I can, gamma can depend on M and N now, which gives us a stronger statement that was very convenient for like getting equipartitions, for example, which we did last week. But here it might just be mysterious if you missed last time. Okay. And so now I'm gonna write a claim Okay, so I know I have my measure mu say it's, it's written as this possibly infinite sum, but now by, by giving myself a little epsilon here, I can start talking about a finite sum and then working with that to kind of re-represent uh, the behavior of the measure. So the claim, which again, I'll write as a statement about mu, and then we will apply the analogous thing to nu as well, but I won't write it twice. So I can partition the type space S V M into finitely many sets. So X zero union X one up through X M. And these will be Clopin sets. So just to, to head off confusion or perhaps to add to it, these will be Clopin sets. And then the V zero will be the definable set associated to this Clopin set. So some people might write the same notation, but I, okay, all right. We'll get to that later. Okay, so we're going to partition this into Clopin sets so that the x0 is acting like our little exceptional set, so it does measure less than epsilon. And for all i greater than or equal to 1, so the xi set contains the pi type in our sum, and it kind of supports like almost the whole measure of xi in the sense that alpha i, which is the measure of that singleton, is at least one minus now gamma, here's what I can choose as gamma, uh, times the measure of xi. Okay? So the measure of xi will be a little bit bigger than alpha i in, in general, because it contains this point, but, but it's not much bigger. Alpha i is at least one minus epsilon times the measure of xi. Okay? Partition. Yeah, sorry, partition. Thank you. That's important. Okay. So what we'll do, what we'll do is define these disjoint x1 up through xm doing the right thing and then let x0 just be the complement and it will have the desired measure. So first there exists pairwise disjoint. This is a very short claim. There exists pairwise disjoint, say open for now. We're gonna just do one thing at a time. So if you see ahead, that's that's good. So there exists pairwise disjoint open x1 up through xm. 
uh, such that PI is in XI. And this is just using the fact that the space is Hausdorff. I mean, I guess I didn't write it, but it was sort of implicit. I'm not, these PIs are pairwise distinct points. I'm not writing, you know, combine them into one term. So the, the PIs are pair, finitely many pairwise distinct points. So it's a Hausdorff space. So I separate them by open sets. Now, the measure of PI is this alpha I. So again, now by regularity of the measure from above, I could maybe shrink this open set a little bit and have it as close to the have it have measure as close to alpha i as I want. So without loss of generality, possibly by shrinking the open set, I can assume that the measure of xi is as close to alpha i from above as I want, in particular alpha i divided by one minus gamma. So gamma is small, obviously. It's not like 15. So this is okay. So this is regularity again. And then after that, this is a point inside of an open set. This is a stone space. So there's a basis of clopen sets. So I can then shrink to a clopen set even inside that. So and xi is clopen. And that's because we have a, this is a totally disconnected uh, space. Okay, so it might, you know, it might make the measure even smaller than alpha i over one minus, but we don't care, but it still contains the point pi. All right. And so now, uh, okay, so we've got, we've got their pairwise disjoint, their clopen. We have the measure inequality we want. And so the x0 is just going to be the complement of the union of the x1 up through xm. And then, well, the measure of x0 has to be less than epsilon because the measure of this union is at least the sum of the alpha i's, right? P1 is an x1, P2 is an x2. So the measure of the union these x1 through xm is at least the sum of the, the finite sum here. Okay, so the measure of the complement has to be less than epsilon. So since sum i equaling one to m alpha i is bigger than one minus epsilon, okay. Okay, yeah, so the, the break will be a slightly late today because I think it's best to just finish the proof. Okay. All right, so we apply the claim, do we do this to, 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 to using mu, we, we get this partition of, of the phi types. So we'll similarly now partition the phi star types. So similarly partition S phi star of M into some other sets. So Y zero union Y one up to Y N. So into Clopen sets such that the Y zero is our small leftover of measure less than epsilon. And for all the other ones, for all J greater than or equal to one, Y J contains Q J, but doesn't have much bigger measure than the measure of qj. So beta j is at least one minus gamma times the new measure of yj. OK, and so now, right, I mean, it might have been more confusing to, to call the, the clopen sets X and Y, and now we're going to switch to the definable sets V and W, but okay. So right, this is a clopen set XI. I can think of it as exactly the types that contain a particular definable set, say VI, so on and did all this stuff. And I can write yj is exactly the set of types that contain a particular uh, phi star definable set wj so where vi is phi definable and wj is phi star definable so that gives us our uh, our definable sets and then it's easy to check or maybe obvious i don't know that um, these definable sets are actually a partition of the model. So we have partitions um, 
mx, oh, I wrote v, oops, okay, so mx into the, the v's and my to the ends. Okay, so this is obvious if I take any point, actual point in the model, then its phi type or phi star type will be in one of these Clopin sets, aka it will satisfy that particular definable set, and they're going to be disjoint because the Clopin sets are disjoint. Okay, and note that the, the measure of V0 is less than epsilon because the measure of V0 is the same as the measure of the Clopin set determined by V0, and the new measure of W0 is less than epsilon. So that, that's all just like the bookkeeping stuff to do the transfer. And now, so fine, so we have the first two bullets and the fact that they're partitions. And so now we just need to do this regularity thing. And that's where we'll finally use the definability of types. Okay, so to do the third bullet, I, I'm gonna fix an I and a J. So other than the exceptional sets. And now um, I'm going to need to get this Tij, this truth value 0, 1, and I'm going to use it, I'm going to get it using the definition for Pi. So let psi of y be, uh, or, uh, be a phi definition for Pi. I'll remind you what that means. So IE um, psi of y is a phi star formula and an instance of phi, so a phi xb is in pi if and only if it satisfies this formula. So b in the model. B in the model, yeah. We're, we're only working in this model. So this is an instance of the formula, yeah. Okay, and so just to just to remind you, so this was, uh, or at least it was, a, it was a corollary of Proposition three point seven, which was a kind of a more, in, uh, a more thorough statement involving like the global coheres and stuff. But this is what you get: you get that all of your types have these definitions. Okay, and so now we can get what is our number tij? It's either zero or one. I'm going to let it be one if and only if this phi star formula psi of y is in the other type qj. So it depends on i and j. It might, it might have been better to write like psi i here, but I won't. So this type, of, this formula depends on pi. And now we're asking, is it in qj? And if it is, we'll set tij equal to one. If it's not, we'll set tij equal to zero. So you can see here, we talked about this briefly last time. I don't want to say too much about it now, but you can see this the, the forking symmetry would tell you something if you wanted to go further and, and see what else you could get, because there is this forking symmetry statement about this. All right. We're almost there. So now we have our Tij well-defined, zero or one. Next thing we need to define is this W prime. So we throw out a little bit before we get things to work. So let's W prime, it's gonna be a subset of WJ. So it's gonna be exactly the set of, the set of Bs in WJ that satisfy this formula. Or, okay, that satisfy the formula or don't, depending on whether Tij is zero or one. So psi tij v holds. So I just wanted to agree with qj on whether, yeah, that's it. Here it is. Okay, so then, okay, first of all, this is a, this is a phi star definable set because wj was phi star definable, psi is a phi star formula. So this is a well-defined phi star definable set. And if I, if I look at the Clopin set, it determines that QJ is in there by definition, right? QJ contains this formula or, or its negation depending on the TIJ. So 
that means that the new measure of wj will be at least beta j, the measure of qj, which is at least one minus gamma times the new measure of wj by the claim. Okay, but I wrote it for the other side. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so this, this definable set has measure at least qj because it contains that point. That measure is beta j. And by the claim, but a dually applied, beta j is at least one minus gamma times nu of okay, yj, which is nu of wj, or identifying the Clopin set and the definable set. Okay, so w prime has the right measure. And now finally, we want to show that we've got this zero one behavior. So, all right, so we've got to here now. So now we'll fix. Sorry, I, I guess I wrote this wrong. This is sorry, this should have been a W prime. I think I was right last time, but I mean, it was in the picture. I don't, I, I throw out a little bit and I'm only looking at the B's in W prime. So fix a B in W prime. Well, then this holds by definition of W prime, but this is the phi definition of P. So phi tij xib is in pi. So that's exactly what, what psi is doing. If it holds a b, then the, the instance is in the type. If it doesn't hold a b, then the instance is not in the type. Also, recall pi is in vi. So I mean, this was by, by construction. So if I look at the mu measure of this instance of phi or its negation. So with B there, but then I look at just the things in VI that satisfy it. So thinking of this as a clopen set, it contains the point PI, right? So you have to switch this around. Yeah, but, but, but PI is now a definable set, and the point PI is in, in the X line. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So really, I should say. VI is in PI since PI is in XI, which is the set of types that contain VI. Sorry about that. Okay. But in any case, if I think about this as a clopen set in the type space, it will contain this point PI. I mean, this isn't nothing like deep is happening here. It's mostly probably just sloppy notation or something. But at any rate, that means this is at least alpha I, because that's the measure of PI and by construction. That's at least one minus gamma times measure of the i. So we get the conclusion. Okay. So it's a good to like, I think maybe draw the picture and think about what's what's going on or whatever, but I've got this unique, I've got this unique number associated to this pair that has to do with the definition of the P PI and its behavior with the QJ. And then that controls kind of almost everything that's happening here because the definition controls what these instances are doing and because these sets are very close in measure to the PI and the QJ. That's basically the idea. All right, so that's the end of the proof of theorem B. And um, it's probably a good, good time for a break. And then I, after the break, we're done with, we're basically done with the goal. So after the break, I was just gonna make some remarks about other directions involving groups, but we'll take a five minute break. Um, I think you can erase, I think you can erase everything. If anybody has questions or anything, ask them soon before this stuff gets erased.
Yeah, yeah what's up? I can have a question. Okay. It's a it's a lemma. Is the lemma true? Oh, was that okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Hello. So I have a question. Yeah. Is a lemma true? Outside, stab outside stability. No, no, no it's just no. not. I mean, yeah, okay. it would not be the case that you expect any, right? I mean, in general, a measure there could be no singletons of positive measure, period. Like, like a, uh, like yeah. a. Okay. In fact, I, I oh, this was the other thing I was going to look up in the notes. I knew there was another thing I forgot. I think Anna did an example very similar to this, where he was like talking about taking the the Lebesgue measure on the interval zero one and thinking about how it kind of becomes a measure on a type space in a particular way, and that would be a that would be an example of a okay. measure like that. Yeah. There would be no okay. singletons mm -hmm. of positive measure. Right. And I think in some, I think that if you put if you phrase this the right way, it becomes another kind of thing that's sort of equivalent to stability. Like okay. every closed set of positive measure contains a point of positive measure, then you're okay. If you say this for every measure, for every measure, mm -hmm. it's a sum of types. Then I, you might, I think you get stability back of the formula. Right. We talked about this before, yeah. Basically, because if you have the order property, you can kind of build a measure that acts like a Lebesgue measure on cuts, and that measure will have no, will have no types of positive. It'll have no singletons with with mass. Yeah. Can you state? Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just about, uh, and this statement about these fee measures concentrating on on types is I think it's it's more or less in like Kiesler's original paper called measures and forking it's there in some I mean I think it's there in some form it's yeah. there essentially but it, but his whole notation is a bit difficult to penetrate you know yeah. but it's, the way he I phrases mean, it might look a little bit closer to the statement saying that the measure of that set s is one that's what I mean yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but then but on an on in survey ish paper the bulletin paper Kind of is the first place that writes out the full proof of that, I think, in, uh, in, in the explicit way. Right? Is, right? is that the right domination regularity? That's that right there. Okay. I don't remember when I stopped. Has it been almost ever? Just wait, back. Just wait for Caroline. We'll wait for Caroline. Back, right? yeah. In fact, Rahim may come back. She, she, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I I don't have that much to say. So if we finish early, it's okay. If we finish yeah, early. Right. Should I keep this with me here, or, or should I give it to Caroline? Oh, whatever. It doesn't matter. Should, should I keep the microphone, Caroline? Yeah. yeah, Caroline's not in charge of this. She might be in charge of the conference, but I'm in charge. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Um, so yeah, I was going to make a couple comments about just to eat my words a little bit. If you saw Caroline's talks talking about groups and stuff, you, you know, you might want to know some of the some type of the the connection. So part four, surprise part, other directions, and I don't know, like. This is just kind of based off of a remark. It's not a perfect segue, but I think the segue makes a little bit of sense, which is that if you look at theorem B and you look at the proof, if you were to somehow know that mu and nu, your measures, were actually sums of finitely many types, then there would be no, no need for those exceptional sets, the V0 and the W0. There would be no need for the epsilon because you would have a finite sum of coefficients equaling one from the start. So I'm just going to say that. So if mu and nu are sums of finitely many types, then theorem B holds with uh, V0 and W0 being empty. 
So, so you could remove the epsilon from the statement and just say, if your measures are sums of finitely many types, then there are M and N, so that for any gamma you pick later, you can get your regularity up to gamma with no, no epsilon appearing. Yes, but, but, but again, you could also get rid of that without the gamma, just with the epsilon. You, you said that, I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we said this before. I mean, okay, but, but this is really a point of, I mean, this, this remark is really about contr controlling the regularity with the better parameter, with the function that, that is allowed to depend on M and N. If you didn't care about that, you could just remove V0 and W0 by throwing them, as we already talked about, throw them into the other v, the VIs to get rid of it, but you would no longer have that, that super control on the regularity in terms of the function, you would just have it in terms of epsilon. So this is really a mark about getting rid of the epsilon and getting better control period. So anyway, I don't know, it's just a question like, when would you expect this to happen though? In general, I don't know. Why would you expect say the pseudo finite counting measure on some arbitrary ultra product of graphs to be a sum of finitely many types? No idea, but there is a nice setting where you get natural measures that are sum sums of finitely many types and it's in the setting of groups. So it's just gonna- huh? Uh, it would be, oh, maybe you're right. No, yeah, yeah, okay, yes. Yeah. So, in, no, yeah, thanks, Caroline. So in the proof, yeah, you measure zero, but then just throw that into something. Just throw it into the V1, and it doesn't add anything to the measure. So measure zero is, is good, is even, is no problem, yeah. I'm not sure. Okay, so I, I did want to just say that what happens in the case of groups. Now, what, what I don't want to do is suggest that, oh, I'll, I'll just say it later. Okay, example. So let's just suppose our model expands uh, a group G, by which I mean I have some group, just throw it into the language if you want, it could be a definable group or whatever. But for simplicity, let's just suppose we have our first order structure is a group in the group language with some extra stuff, perhaps. Okay. And let's suppose our formula phi xy is left invariant, by which I mean the Boolean algebra of phi definable sets is invariant under left translation. You can give a kind of a local formulation just for phi if you want, but it's best to think about it this way. So i.e. this Boolean algebra def, I'm just gonna write it like this, phi definable subsets of G is left invariant. So I'm, I'm saying assume, sorry. So assume this and also assume, um, well, okay, let's say that, let's write that later. So for some notation, so call, a subset X of G generic, or maybe better to say left generic, if you can cover G by finitely many left translates of X. G. Yeah. Thank you. So for some finitely many left translates of X, and then call a type, a P type, generic if every formula in the type defines a generic set. And I'm still kind of just working on this one model, right? So we don't, we don't have to think about elementary extensions for this stuff. All right, so generic types in general, they're there, you would not necessarily expect such types to exist in general in this setup, but if you assume that the formula is stable, then you have generic types plus more. So I'm going to write that down. So now assume again our formula is stable. Then there's a uh, theorem which is kind of a gluing together of earlier work of Hrushovsky and Pillay, and then later work that we did with, with, with Caroline, myself, and Anim um, talking about like the Kiesler measure situation towards this arithmetic regularity thing. So, okay, so Hrushovsky, Pillay, and the 
paper 1994, and then more recently, 2017. So um, the statements, you have to pick and choose which paper you can find them in, but okay. So first is that there are generic types and only finitely many of them. So there exists finitely many, how should I say this? Finitely positively many, okay? So the finite number is not zero. Is that, is that all right? So finitely many generic P types, P1 up through Pn. There's gonna be more to say here. Um, so I, if, if you're familiar with the notation, you might have a, or if, sorry, familiar with the setting, you might care more about different aspects of it, but I'm just writing down kind of exactly what I need to, to compare to the previous situation. So there's also, I think, might be sort of implicit for what I'm gonna write down here, but the group acts transitively on the generic types. B, there's also a Kiesler measure. There exists a unique left invariant Kiesler phi measure, which I'll call mu. So by left invariant, I mean that the measure of a formula is the same as the measure of any left translate of that formula. And this is all making sense because of our assumption that the Boolean algebra is left invariant. Oh, I was going to say an example here. I'm sorry. So take a subset A in G that's definable and look at the formula that says, so suppose our, our phi x y just says x is in y times A. So this is sort of a canonical example of a left invariant formula. The instances of the formula are just the left translates of A. So clearly the Boolean algebra generated by those is still left invariant. Okay, so there is a unique left invariant Kieser measure. And moreover, it fits into the context of this remark. Moreover, this measure is it, the, the perfectly weighted sum of the finitely many generic types. So each, each type gets measure one over n. C, given a subset X of G, which is say uh, phi definable, we have that, okay, a set has positive measure. So mu of X is greater than, is greater than zero if and only if X is generic. So one direction of this is always going to be true. If you, have, if you have a set that's generic, then it has to have positive measure by additivity of the measure and the fact that the measure of G is one. But it's the other direction that is interesting here, using stability. If a set has positive measure, then it's actually generic. And then finally, D, there exists a definable, I should say phi definable, finite index, a subgroup, which you might call G zero phi contained in G, such that the map, so I have a map from the generic types to left cosets of G. Why is this the case? Well, if, the, if it's, a, it's a phi definable set, it's also a subgroup of finite index so I cover, I cover the whole group by the finitely many le left cosets. So every type will have to say, yeah, I'm in one of those cosets. But the point is that looking just at the generic types, so given by, you know, given by, I'm just, I know I'm not writing it 100% clear, but hopefully what I'm saying out loud, but some coset HI, some left coset HI is in the type PI. This is a bijection. more than that, in fact, but that's all I'll say for now. Um, okay, maybe I'll say out loud, the, the, uh, the group acts transitively on the generic types, and that gives you like a morphism of homogeneous spaces or whatever. This is not necessarily a normal subgroup, so this is only a homogeneous space of left cosets, but all right. Okay, so this is what you can prove. Um, yeah, and, mo and basically, all of it is either stated in the Hrushovsky Filet paper or not terribly difficult to derive from the results there, but the results in that, in that older paper aren't, aren't about Kieser measures. Okay, and so then in the, but then in that later paper, we use this to prove 
this stable regularity theorem, which now I'll write in a slightly different form that appears in our paper, but, but my point is to emphasize this remark of how you can make it a little bit stronger using the fact that you're, we're talking about a measure that's a sum of finitely many types. So this is now going to be a finite statement, a statement about stable sets and finite groups. So fix k greater than or equal to one and a function sigma from the natural numbers to zero one. So this is modeled, this is like mo modeled after theorem A, kind of similar vein there. Now suppose G is an arbitrary finite group and I take a subset A of G such that this binary relation X and Y times A is K stable in exactly the same way as before thinking about a bipartite relation being K stable as we defined before then there exists a subgroup H of G of index some number little n bounded by some capital n that depends only on the stability k and our function sigma so not on the size of the group uh, such that n depends on sigma too yeah yeah i mean in a, so in our paper we stated with an epsilon a constant epsilon but really oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah so this is like depending on epsilon such that for any element of the group either either g either the, the left translate the coset gh intersects a in a very small set so sigma of n times the size of h or gh intersects a in a very large set so size at least one minus sigma n times the size of h okay And the the error, the size of this error, how close how close does a come to either being sort of disjoint from this coset or containing the coset? This error can be like arbitrarily good depending on the the index of the group. You can pick a, an int a function here. So like by using this, you can then easily prove that like you could you could make h a normal subgroup by taking the intersection of its conjugates and picking an appropriate sigma it would all work out to be whatever you want. So things like that, okay? So a couple of remarks just to say, one is that we, despite, I'm, I'm setting up sort of an, a parallel here, but we don't use theorem A or the maliara shala stable regularity to prove this. You, you get, there is a regularity statement, but there would be no reason to expect that the partition was given by cosets of the subgroup if you applied it to a formula like this. So it's all done from, from scratch um, using this theorem, but then it's kind of a similar type of pseudo finite argument from from this theorem to here. Uh, and, and yeah, but, but the main remark I wanted to make is that you get, you get a statement with no epsilon, no like global error epsilon or no global exceptional set involving an epsilon because of this fact that the, that the measure upstairs that's really controlling everything is a sum of finitely many types, not infinitely many types. So I don't know, I think it could be interesting to, to find other natural examples, natural examples. Where, where these kinds of measures show up that are finite sums of finitely many types on stable formulas. And this is sort of the only one I know. Okay, that's it, that's the end. Thanks everybody. Is there any, anybody, any questions, comments, uh, anybody? No, 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 no. All right. Well, and maybe I have a comment or question. Like yes. in the 